content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the whole care network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the whole care network. Hello and welcome to Daughterhood, the podcast. I am your host, Roseanne Corcoran, Daughterhood Circle Leader and Primary Caregiver. Daughterhood is the creation of Ann Tumlinson, who has worked on the front lines in the healthcare field for many years and has seen the multitude of challenges caregivers face. Our mission is to support and build confidence in women who are managing their parents' care. Daughterhood is what happens when we put our lives on hold to take care of our parents. We recognize this care is too much for one person to handle alone. We want to help you see your efforts are not only good enough, they are actually heroic. Our podcast goal is to bring you some insight into navigating the healthcare system, provide resources for you as a caregiver, as well as for you as a person, and help you know that you don't have to endure this on your own. Join me in daughterhood. Caregiving is inherently difficult, but navigating care for an estranged parent, or even one who challenges your boundaries, adds more layers of stress and emotional turmoil. Today, my conversation is with two people who understand this. Laura Davis is a writing teacher and an author of seven books, including her first memoir, The Burning Light of Two Stars, a mother-daughter story which tells of her traumatic and tumultuous relationship with her mother, which included caring for her at the end of her life. Karen Anderson is a life coach and author of five books, including Difficult Mothers, Adult Daughters, A Guide for Separation, Liberation, and Inspiration. We discuss not only the challenges that accompany these relationships, but how you can find peace in the midst of it. I hope you enjoy our conversation. You know, there are people, I think, who start to care give and then think, well, I'm going to mend my relationship with them while doing this, or this will bring us closer. And it's, you have to get it right in your mind that this is not a Hallmark movie. It can be. (laughs) (laughs) It can be. It can be. But it's hard because whatever problems you had, whatever issues you had are still there. If you never worked on them, they're still there. And then they just kind of grow. And then you throw in a little sleep deprivation, depending if you're living with them or not living with them, or even if you're running back and forth, you're still fried, you're still anxious, you're still stressed. And all of that adds up into this big stew. Yeah, and I think, you know, if there is a history of betrayal you know, it just complicates. I mean, being a caregiver in and of itself is hard enough, is is an overwhelming task. But then when you have the complexities of the kind of relationships that we're talking about, it just, it adds a lot of complexity. You know, in my case, I felt like my mother and I had resolved a lot of things, but her decline just brought everything up that I thought had been resolved in the past. You know, it was not resolved. It was, it was papered over, you know, uh, even though I got a lot of therapy, it was still, it was dormant. And her behavior, when she started having dementia, um, she started acting out her worst characteristics that I really hadn't been up against in years. And suddenly it was all in my face again, you know, in, and I was Uh, in close proximity to her after having had a 3000 mile buffer between us. Every time I read that in your book, it made me laugh because it was like, we had a 3000 mile buffer. And I thought, wow, yeah. And that's a buffer. And then when she moved, all of that went out the window. One of my jobs was like being head researcher, you know, like I, and that was something I'm really good at is, is accessing resources. And I just had to find out so much stuff I didn't know about to serve my mother's needs, you know, like, 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 what are the places that are near here? And what are the pros and cons? And, you know, how do you jump through these hoops? And where, where's the support group for, for people with early stage Alzheimer's disease? And, you know, just all of that, that, that was something I was able to do for my mother. And actually, it, it was something I easily did for my mother, because it didn't really require any emotional closeness to make it, it was much more challenging being with her in person and dealing with her volatile emotions than it was to, you know, be the information gatherer. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the stuff 
and then the stuff. <laughs> it's, you know, you can, you can do all of that, but the, the guts of it, and even still, my wish is that when someone's diagnosed at the doctor's office, they say, here's your, here's your forms. Here's where you find this and this and this. Instead of everybody leaving there in such uh, a, a disarray and not knowing where to go because there's no roadmap. And then you have to piecemeal all of this together while you're trying to also support this person in whatever relationship you're in. And it's like you're, drugg- you're, you're juggling knives. And it's, it just adds to all of that stress. Right. And if you have, I had teenagers at home when this was going on, you know, it's like I was, I was in the sandwich generation Mm -hmm. and it's a whole other set of stresses. Because at the end of the day, you're always, you always feel like you're letting somebody down. Right. At the end of the day, you lay there and think, well, who got the short end of the stick today? And you're not, and you're not even on the list. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, Laura, when I, when I was reading your book, it's so Honestly, it's just breathtaking between your writing and the story and all of it. Uh, it just, it sat with me and it stayed with me for a long time. And it, it just, it, it got me thinking about how you actually did this. And that's part of why I wanted to do this episode is because how do you, I liked my mother. I didn't, you know, we would go on vacation together. We had a different relationship, but I often wonder how that feels when there are times when you you even said you saw her as an em- enemy, you saw her as a betrayer, you saw her from this imperfect human, but she genuinely loved you. How do you make that transformation in your own being, in your own mind? Like, how did that come about for you? How did you transform from point A to point B? You know, I mean, that's what I wrote a whole memoir about because it's it's it took decades. I mean, it's not like you can't just turn a switch. Um, no. You know, I think the first thing for me, because there was a huge betrayal um, with my mother, is I had to heal from that betrayal first. Like that was number one. I, everyone was urging me when we were estranged, bitterly estranged, everyone around me, not everyone, but many of my relatives were like, just let bygones be bygones. This happened a long time ago. Just, you know, like get over it already. What are you going to carry this on for the rest of your life? That, that kind of thing. Um, and right. the, the truth is I had to heal. And in my case, there was incest in my family um, with my grandfather. My mother denied it. I said it happened. Um, and I had to heal from that abuse. And I had to heal from being um, denied acknowledgement by my mother and being called a liar, you know, and that I, I had made all this up to destroy her. I had to get over that and, and that she was not there for me at the worst moments of my life which was in my late twenties when I was dealing with this, I had to heal from all of that. I had to do years of therapy. I had to do years of, I had to express my anger, my grief. Um, I had to get through it. I had to get to the point where I realized that it was not going to control the rest of my life. And that I, it was something, it's not that I, I, you completely get over these things, but I could get over it to the point of having a functional, happy adult life. And until I got to that point, I wasn't ready to turn around and try to work things out with my mother because I still was feeling too damaged. So that was the first thing. And then we had a lot of back and forths. When I um, got pregnant with my first child, I was 35 years old. And I think that was a real turning point in our relationship because I wanted her to be a grandmother. Um, You know, there's some people you wouldn't want to have around your kids, but my mother had some good qualities and she was a good grandmother. I wanted that for her and she really wanted to know my children. Um, So I think that motivated both of us. And, you know, one of the stages we went through was agreeing to disagree. You know, we set aside this huge elephant in the room. I gave up trying to get her to acknowledge what had happened. And she gave up trying to get me to recant. And there were some years, a period of years where we started focusing on what were the things we still had actually in common. And they were, some of them were really small things. Like we love playing cards together. So we would play cards. We like going to the movies together. My mother was an actor. We both love the theater. And so we started with the ways we could connect and we left the unresolved stuff there. And we had, there were a lot of blowups. There was a lot, it was a very volatile for a long time. Um, the other thing my mother did, we're talking about geography a little earlier is that she started coming out to California for several months every winter. You know, she wanted to get away from the cold, 
New Jersey winter. She used to go to San Miguel de Ende in Mexico. And she gave that up and she started coming to Santa Cruz. Not to, she didn't stay with me. She had her own apartment, her own friends. And I was not happy about it. You know, I was not welcoming at first, but those visits meant that during those three months every year, she got to get to know her grandchildren. She would come over for dinner. Um, we would play cards. We would do things together. And we gradually began connecting in the present in a more positive way. And so, you know, it just, it kind of grew from, from there um, until mm -hmm. we ended up with, I, I think, a pretty decent level of reconciliation. We did not have an intimate relationship. And I, I never made myself vulnerable to her. Like, I didn't confide in her. I didn't feel safe in my deeper self. But on a more superficial level, we had a functional relationship. And you know, that was the case for a long time. And then when she got older and she started developing dementia and she called to announce she was moving across the country, it just changed everything. You know, it's like that that careful equilibrium we had achieved was just blown mm -hmm. apart. And then, you know, the story I write in my memoir is what happened in the the years from the time I got that phone call until her death and really facing, is it possible to be a caregiver to someone who betrayed you in the past? And that's that's what I explored. I wanted to open my heart to her. You know, I mean, that was, I, I hoped that that could happen. And even though I kind of dreaded her arrival, I was also hopeful, um, wishing that maybe we could heal our relationship the rest of the way. That was the journey I wanted to write about. In that moment, and and Karen, I don't know, in those types of moments, like, okay, we have this buffer and now she's coming. What do you do? How do you prepare yourself? Do you think that it's necessary to be vulnerable when you're caring for someone? Can you still care for them and have that divide? I, I actually should mention that I was my grandmother's legal guardian and caregiver, my mother's mother. Mm -hmm. um, from about 2012 through her death at the end of 2015, October of 2015. So three years. And there was a lot unexpected that happened as a result of that. And my relationship with my grandmother was strained and weird. And, but again, different, it's not my mother, right? Where it's, there's a layer there that doesn't exist between the mother and the daughter, but having had that experience and not knowing how I would grow through that experience. On, and now on the other side of it, I am absolutely grateful for that experience. And I know that I can't predict how things will be with my mom. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting because my answer to that question of how do you prepare is different today than it was when I actually wrote Difficult Mothers, Adult Daughters. Because now I have a greater understanding of our nervous systems and trauma and triggers. <laughs> And it was interesting because yesterday when I planned this call with my mom to, so she could talk about the rest, I had no idea what she was going to say. I didn't know if it was just going to be like, well, here's my will and here's my, or, you know, what? Right. <laughs> and she's 81 for, for reference. And I noticed, I noticed prior to calling her, cause I had planned to call her at 10 AM. I noticed my heart was beating a little faster I felt shallow breathing a little bit and I know myself well enough to go, okay, yeah, you're, you're triggered, triggered a little bit here, right? You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know which mother you're going to get. Is she going to be nice? Is she going to be mean? What's going to happen? You know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I think the beautiful aspect for me yesterday was being able to be with myself in that triggered, the sensations that I was experiencing and not judge myself. And to just be like, oh yeah, this is, all this is, is your body perceives a threat. That's all. Logically, you're safe here in Connecticut, right? Mm -hmm. It's just a phone call, but your body doesn't know that. Your body is scared. Your body doesn't like this. And so that's why it feels this way. And so getting to know yourself on that level is priceless in, in regards to preparing. Mm -hmm. And again, this is new, you know, not brand new, but I mean, it's relatively new for, I think, the general public to sort of be talking about our nervous systems. And yes, we've talked about triggers for years, but do we really understand what that means? And so getting to know yourself on that level, getting to know, you know, what it is you value, and then obviously boundaries are a huge 
part of the conversation. And I like to, you know, boundaries are such a word that it, it seems like it's what is going to keep things out. Right. And that it's a protection and it can be, it is partly that, but I have the way I teach boundaries is that it's also about what we want to grow and what we want to keep in. What do we want to cultivate in this relationship? And Laura speaks to that. Right. And it's not perfect, right? No, it's not perfect. It's messy at times, but, but there are, there are ways to look at boundaries in that are, that are not so rigid and like you're bad. I need to keep you out. Right. And in, in your book, you, you referenced, it's not, it's not avoiding, it's not ignoring, it's not resisting. It's not that. And it's also not the complaining and the wallowing and the, let me tell you about what happened. It's not either of those things. So there's some place in between those two, but it's more about us than them. Yeah. And, and I think that when I read that, I thought, Well, that makes perfect sense. Can you speak to that a little bit where people think a boundary is, well, I'm just not going to talk to you. That's not, that's not it because you're still can be. Right. But but it's still eating at you. Right. So there are times when a boundary is crossed and you feel annoyed or frustrated or angry. And that is simply a message that is simply a cue, right? Something has happened here that I don't like. And it's usually that a boundary has been crossed or that there isn't a boundary that where there needs to be a boundary or where you want to have a boundary. And the the key isn't that you set the boundary in that moment. The way I, and it's funny because it has evolved a little bit since I wrote the book, but the way I um, describe a healthy boundary, it's an equation and it is your value or a value that you have plus a request plus a, an action plus a benefit equals a healthy boundary. Now the value and the benefit are optional, but they can be helpful. Mm-hmm. So the core, the core, if we just look at action and, and action, or I'm sorry, request and action as like the core of a healthy boundary, right? And I, again, this is a very simple one, but like, let's say your mother calls you every day and you don't want to talk to her every day. The request is, please don't call me every day. And then you have to know the action that you will take if she continues to call you every day. And a simple one would be that you don't answer the phone <laughs> when she calls, right? Now you can expand that into what is the value and what is the benefit? <clears throat> so the value might be that you, it's quality time, let's say, right? You value quality time with your family, your mother, your kids, whoever. So you're, you can, you can lean on quality time and say, Hey, please don't call me every day. Let's talk once a week for an hour. Let's talk once a week on Sundays for an hour. That way, here's the benefit. I can give you my undivided attention. But if you're calling me every day, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to do that. So that's, you know, that, that is, that is sort of like the whole equation of right. value request action and, and uh, benefit. benefit. And so and it, it was interesting because I was speaking to um, a group of women who are caring for elderly mothers with memory issues recently. And one of them brought up um, that her mother brings food over every day. And she doesn't want her mother to bring food over every day. And I said, well, have you told her that? And she said, yes, well, she's got memory issues. She's, and I said, and it was, it was, there were a lot of women on this call and watching their their faces was, it was interesting. I said, well, how about mom, please don't bring food over every day, bring food over once a week. If you bring food over every day, I will throw it away. And they're like, "Oh, oh, you know, it was like, oh, I could never. Right. Here's the thing. You don't have to communicate that piece. Exactly. But you want to, you know, I mean, I jokingly say this, but it's like, if you have a choice between guilt and resentment, choose guilt. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Right. Right. You know, right. I mean, the resentment will, will just like poison your relationship more than it maybe already is. Right. And that, right. that resentment seeps out into all your other relationships. Mm-hmm. You know, it's right. And, As you're talking, I'm talking right. about like, if you, you know, like my mother was not able to uh, respect my boundaries when, when, when she was younger, for one reason, she didn't want to. Right. <laughs> impulsive. 
and narcissistic. And then later she couldn't because she had dementia. And it's like, right. And then it was like, okay, is this because she has dementia or is this because she's doing the same thing she's always done? And if it's dementia, it's like really hard to get very angry about it. Exactly. But if it's, the you know, so I was always trying to sort out, you know, where is this lack of responsiveness coming from? Well, and also, right, if she was disrespectful of your boundaries when you were younger, intentionally, right, you have the anger, which is a trigger, which is a nervous system response. Right. So, of course, like, even if you know it's not on purpose, you are primed, right, right to be angry. Yes. And that's that's the circle. Yeah. But when dementia, when dementia comes into play, it, it all bets, it, boundaries don't really they're, they're Swiss cheese because depending, because you can't, you can't say, mom, I told you, don't, I told you doesn't work. Well, but I, even without dementia, ultimately, right. The boundary is with ourselves. It's right. being, it's, it's being willing to take the action that we say we're going to take. We're honoring the boundary. Right. And I have no, I have <clears throat> not all the time, but I have seen it. I've seen it with my own mother for, for ac- actually like, that when I'm honoring, when I'm really truly honoring my boundaries, she tends to honor them more. Yeah. Right. Not always, not perfectly, but. But (laughs) I think one of the important things too, is when you say it's not your mother's job or responsibility to respect your boundaries, it's your responsibility. And that gives you a little bit of power. It gives you the empowerment. Yeah. The other thing too, you know, and this, this sort of gets into like, why, why do mothers and daughters struggle to begin with? And there's so much out there, but it is a macro issue. And, you know, I feel like it's important to just bring this into the conversation. And that is that, you know, in a culture that where women aren't valued equally, where sexism, misogyny, patriarchy, all of that impacts the mother daughter relationship, but like getting back to the idea of, you know, like the woman with the, you know, her mother bringing the food, you Mm -hmm. know, please don't, if you don't, I'll throw it away. That is very clear, right? It's brief, it's clear. And it's, there's no wishy-washy, there's no vagueness about it. And to quote one of my favorite people, Brene Brown, right? She says, clarity is kind unclarity or, you know, not not unclear is unkind. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. And, you know, when we think about values with boundaries, right, kindness, respect are two real obvious um, values. And it's like, we have to include ourselves in that. It's not like we're just doing it to be nice to them. The clarity and the kindness is for us too. You know, there, there are situations where you can't respect your own boundaries. I mean, when no. you're a caregiver, I was, I was just going to say there that are so many times <laughs> just where, where say the name of the game is you have to surrender to the moment. That's and, absolutely and you right. You have to show up and you have to be there and you think you can't and you can. And I found that I ended up feeling like a better, more capable human being. I was more capable of compassion. I found that I took care of myself every way I could, but I could no longer control the situation in the same way I nope. could when my mother was had more capacity. Um, yes, and yeah. sometimes I had to walk away and I had to have support. I built, I did a lot to build support. I joined support groups. I got myself back into therapy. My partner Karen was incredibly helpful to me. Um, I did so many things to take care of myself, but there were times it was just like. I had to keep giving, or I had to keep giving up my own plans, my own ideas, my own agenda. And it just went with the territory. Yep. And that's yeah, I mean, there's absolutely times, true. You know, and I'm not taking care of my mom, but there are times where I have had, you know, I have, I have not honored my own boundaries with her. And I have to own that. And, you know, and it's, some it's not pretty sometimes you know it's it's awkward and it's yeah there's all this inner work that I you know that we do hopefully to not shame ourselves and to not hold ourselves to some level of perfection or like this is gonna work like a well-oiled machine because it's not (laughs) well no because it can't because it's it's the other whenever you're caring you know it's great that you're having dinner with your children 
And if your mother needs to use the restroom, you got to go help her get to the restroom. There are things that come up that there is no getting around. It was it was your trip back, Laura, when your mother hurt her leg. Right. And you knew if you didn't go, it was going to be another day, but your kids were waiting and you had all of that, all of that angst and you had to choose. It's the, how do you come to terms with that in the midst of this? I just, I remember that, that feeling of feeling like I was in a vice, you know, and it was, it's similar to what you were saying before, you know, squeezed between my children's needs, my mother's needs and my needs. You know, I had a, I had, I was self-employed. I had a business. I was teaching. I was traveling. I had a career. I had a demented mother in town and two teenagers. Um, And it was, it was incredibly difficult. And, and that, that feeling of failing, on all mm-hmm. fronts um, was something I I felt a lot. Um, and there were I, the other thing I want to say is that you know we're talking about how hard it is. There was a lot of humor. Totally. Uh, there there were a lot of moments. My mother was hysterical when she had dementia. I mean, sometimes she, <laughs> sometimes she would. I remember this one time I said to her I had had breast cancer, you know, and I was talking about my breast cancer, you know, and she said you had breast cancer. I said, yeah, ma. She said, they cut your boobs off. I just like started cracking up. I mean, it you it, it was like theater of the absurd uh, mm-hmm. a lot of the time. And I had to kind of go with that, go with that humor and just, just surrender when I could and then grab the moments where I could do what I wanted or take care of myself or, you know, go out in the woods or go to the ocean or, you know, have a special time with my daughter or whatever. I just did that when I could. And then, you know, there'd be the 12 phone calls the next day. Right. And it's those, it's those taking those moments. And that's where, you know, the support and the self-care, and I hate self-care as a word, but you have to build that in for yourself because you have to survive it because it will end. And then you're left with whatever you're left with. And you have to find ways to find that support and to find something to feed your soul as you're going through this. I mean, writing was a big part for me. I mean, that's how I ended sure. up writing this memoir is, you know, I, I was, I would sit in the doctor's office with my mother you know, she was kind of out of it. And I would be taking notes because she couldn't remember anything. And I'd also be writing like what was on the wall, what poster was on the wall and what was the little bits of dialogue. And because I'm a writer, you know, and we cannibalize our lives. And I, I was always thinking I'm going to have to write about this because this is just unbelievable what's going on here. <laughs> so that was one way I helped. It created a little bit of distance, you know. I said to my husband, yeah. After after the call with my mom yesterday, I'm like content for the rest of my life. <laughs> she moves here, like that's right. It is. It exactly. absolutely is. I did the same thing, Laura. Every day, it's almost like part of it is also a recording of what was happening. Like I can't believe what's happening. I can't believe this is where we're at. And it was therapy, really, aside from therapy and support group and all of that. But it's an it's an experience, and it's. Um, Well, it's interesting because, you know, Karen, when you say about the triggers, you also wrote about the amygdala and and how that kind of sits in there, but it's only a 90 second emotion. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if it's 90 seconds exactly, but I think that if, you know, what I've heard is that if you allow an emotion to be there, right, Mm -hmm. you notice the annoyance come in or like me starting to feel nervous yesterday, right. Or sadness or whatever it is, if you just sort of let it be there and you say, okay, I'm going to be with this sensation and not try to block it in any way or stuff it or avoid it. Right. Mm -hmm. It'll flow through in about 90 seconds, two minutes. I I actually have a colleague who says it's like drinking a glass of water. It flows through and then you pay. We generally don't like the way emotions feel. No. And we haven't been taught how to be with emotions. We've been taught to like cut here down is off. <laughs> right. It's like, what is that? I sat with my anger long enough and found out it, her name was grief. Yeah. That's so true. It really is. Now, Laura, when you were caring, did all of that old stuff come up? Yeah. It, it, it absolutely did because, you know, my mother, and especially in the early stages of her dementia, you know, before she got more passive, but in the beginning, uh, she was incredibly agitated. Um, She was anxious. She was rageful. She was explosive. Um, She was erratic. 
She was irrational. And it was like she it was like all her worst qualities that I had grown up with were being replicated. And they were playing out in front of me on a daily basis. And I was I was triggered all the time. And yet I was trying to be the good daughter, you know, so there was like there was this part, this overlay of me trying to do the right things. And I did. I went through the motions. I I prepared for her impeccably, you know, her arrival. Mm -hmm. And I I did all the right things you could do. But um, I was constantly being triggered. And I still had this wall up to her. You know, it was just a different kind of wall. It wasn't, it wasn't the wall of rage. It wasn't the wall of distance, 3000 miles distance, you know, but, and it wasn't like the polite rules of detente of this is how we've made peace. Uh, but, but I still had this wall and she confronted me about it because I, I remember this one time I went over to visit her. I had been away uh, teaching for a week. I came back and I was helping her with her computer and her printer and, you know, all this, she was still living on her own then. And I just, she was going on and on about how miserable she was. And I was somewhere else. I was thinking about my daughter in school. I was thinking about my son and she confronted me about it. She knew I wasn't present. And that also that I was just, I didn't want to touch her. I didn't want to go near her. I was like being polite, but it was this false politeness. And, you know, she confronted me and afterwards I, you know, I went home and I wrote about that wall that I'd had be always up. And I looked at all the different ways it had shifted over the years. And I realized that there was a part of me that really was longing to know if it was possible to take down that wall. And, and that was the trajectory for me um, of the rest of the years of her life was, could I take down that wall? Could I allow myself to love her and not always feel I had to protect myself from her? And, you know, I think the most ironic thing for me, which was painful is that when her dementia uh, developed more, she turned sweet. And I, I really expected her to turn bitter and nasty. You know, I thought she'd be one of those kind of people with dementia who are really, really challenging, but she turned sweet. And I would walk into her apartment in assisted living and she would say, Lori, you're the best daughter in the whole world. What would I do without you? You know, and then she'd say things like, you and Karen have done such a great job with those kids. Who says lesbians shouldn't have children? <laughs> <laughs> and she, she, she was so loving. And it was like the, the love and attention I had longed for my whole life was there. But she, was, she wasn't the same mother anymore. And so it was like it, it, it finally became safe to love her when she was no longer herself. Hmm. Oh my goodness, Laura. And where does, where do you put that? Where do you put that? Yeah. I, I, I felt a lot of grief. I, I mean, I felt it was so, um, so many mixed feelings because I, I, I drank in her love and this, yeah. this, this love that was safe. It no longer had barbs and attacks attached to it, it because she was beyond the capability of doing that. So I took it in and yet I would dread going to see her. You know, so it was just, it was so, it was painful to see her decline. It was painful to be around her and know it wasn't her anymore. I missed her feistiness, even though I had hated it forever. You know, it was just so complicated. It was just really, really complicated. Um, but I, I did drink in her love. And, and it was like, that was the truth. The truth was she did love me unconditionally. This was all this shit in the way. Right. Um, that, you right. know, the, all these other layers of other things that made her so reactive and so difficult. And so I, I really drank that in. I took it in and I um, it, it was a very painful, um, challenging time. I, um, I, I, I wonder if my mother, which way, if, well, first of all, will she have dementia? I don't know. Um, and will she become sweet? She has, she can be sweet. But, um, you know, again, something that was very helpful to me, again, learning about the nervous system and recognizing that when somebody perceives a threat, whether it's actually there or not, right, um, they will act a certain way. And my mom tends to fight. That is her like tendency. And mine is to freeze. So I've learned like, okay, I don't want to trigger her. She, I mean, I have a nervous system. She has a nervous system, right? And, and it's like, it's the triggered nervous systems that are having the relationship, right. not our higher selves. Right. <laughs> um, and I, I, 
you know, I'm, I, it's funny. I was going to say I'm naive enough, but I'm not going to use that language. And I'm okay with hoping. I'm okay with hoping and maybe being let down or whatever that my mother will have that sweetness. Um, but I feel like, you know, sort of like Laura's before, which is I never know what I'm going to get. And sometimes what I get is pretty awful. And yes, I have learned to not take it as personally, although sometimes I do. And then I have to have a conversation with myself about that. And I think for me, and I don't know, you know, for other women, I think it's, I think we can, we can get at it in different ways, but the more I have been able to have compassion for myself and like recognizing that a lot of the messages that I received from my mother just sort of in general, but also about me that I used to believe, being able to have compassion for the part of me that didn't know better has helped me have compassion for her, the part of her that doesn't know better. Yeah. Which doesn't mean that I think she's stupid because she's not, but there's, 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 th- there are things that, that just, you know, given the time, the time, the times we live in that we have access to and knowledge of that our mothers didn't have time. They didn't, they, were, they didn't have quite, have quite the, the access to what we now know. It, it, it took me a lot of decades to get to the point of looking at my mother from, you know, more like a 30,000 foot view instead mm-hmm. of seeing her as my antagonist, but mm. to really see like I'm Jewish and there's like the epigenetics of trauma going through the generations in my family. Um, there's the fact that my perpetrator, my grandfather was her father. Um, there's the fact that she grew up, you know, to poor immigrant parents and was terribly ashamed of her poverty. There was, you know, the very limited options for women of her generation, which she blew right past. You know, it's like I, as I looked at her, not just as my mother and as this impediment, but when I looked at her whole life, she was really an awesome person. You know, I mean, she, there was so much to admire about her, but it took me many decades to get to the point of being able to really see that and appreciate that. And then, and then just realize that she went as far as she could, you know, in terms of trying to believe me or trying to support me, she, she wanted to, she tried to, and she hit a wall and she didn't have the skills or resources to get past that wall. And so it it felt so much better to reach a place of real compassion for her not papered over compassion, like I'm gonna I'm gonna stuff everything and pretend nothing is wrong right. and put yeah, it no. on my face. But to actually, <laughs> this will be great. To actually yeah. reach that place of deep compassion for her as a as a troubled, complicated human being. And and also to start seeing myself the same way, that I was mm-hmm. not the hero of the story. And I think that's it took me 10 years to write this memoir because I had to get get past me being the hero and her being the villain. I had to really be able to portray us as fully human. And I had to mature a lot. It took a long time to get there. Yeah. Well, yeah, I would think it would. And it's funny because it's like you you see you see her as a person, not just mom. She's a person and she has her own history and she has her own baggage. And she has her own triggers. And I think we forget that sometimes. And I think one of the things that you addressed, Karen, that really was a light bulb for me also was what meaning do you assign to those words? When is it simply, did you call your uncle and not, did you call your uncle stupid? Exactly. You know, <laughs> you know it's not, yeah. it's not, she's not saying, well, you know, I have to remind you because you're dumb and you forget that's not what she's saying. She's, it was a question. It's what you're hearing. It's like impact versus intent. That's yeah. not, that was not my intention, but that's how you, and I think when, when those things land like that, we're already ready for a fight. Yeah. hundred percent. I, um, and my mom does say things like that to me. So well, that's probably why um, you assign that meaning. <laughs> but, but here's the thing I have had to work on asking myself if I want to believe that about me. Right. And, and, and like, you know, we have stories about our moms and they have stories about us. And there was a situation um, last summer we went and visited and my husband um, was talking to her and whether it was intentional or not, he really challenged her worldview of me in a way she didn't like. 
And <laughs> it was, it was a, it was a, a, a weird situation afterwards, but it was almost like I could see her being like, wait, what? My daughter isn't an idiot, you know, or, oh, my daughter isn't this weak, ineffectual person. <laughs> And wait, no, no, reel that back in. I got to, I got to reestablish my, my story here. And this is one of those times where I didn't have very good boundaries. And, but interestingly, in the moment, I, you know, I, I, one of the things I like to, to teach and, and practice myself is again, finding out what is, what are maybe three things that you value that you can carry with you and lean into. Um, when you need support with your boundaries and my three, and I actually have them on my wall right here, dignity, expression, and audacity. That's a great combination. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. Dignity and audacity are pretty far apart and they serve different purposes. And in that moment, in this situation, I chose dignity for myself and for her. Right. And the way that that looked for me, was recognizing that it was going to be hard for me to not cry because I was angry. It's going to make me, it's making me feel a little teary right now. So I just, I put my sunglasses on. We were outside. I put my sunglasses on and I took a little walk and I came back and I just kind of had my energy be a little bit in. And it's not like, I don't, you know, again, I don't think, you know, somebody would have said, oh, you're being rude to your mother or, oh, you're being mean to your mother. It was just, it was a shift that I noticed in me. Mm-hmm. That I was able to then, you know, be in that situation because I was focused on dignity. Ours, both of us. So it's things like that. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, that's great. And is that what you, so would you advise that? Yeah. Going forward for anybody caring of. Yes. You know, I mean, values work is done in all kinds of places, right? It's not, I didn't make it up, right? Mm-hmm. But, you know, people uh, in therapy and coaching and all different, you know, types of scenarios, we have opportunities to really delve into what it is we value and how can we use those values in support of what how we want to be in the world. And the way I do it is, you know, I, I came up with these these three and I... I know that each of them feel differently in my body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I know I I actually have a list. I don't, I can't pull it out right now. And it's not very pretty. It's just all scribbled, but it's like a list of, of I am statements or, and some of them aren't, some of them are just other kinds of statements that support me in feeling each of those three things. Mm -hmm. And, and it's funny. I think this speaks to what Laura was saying earlier and about understanding that, you know, we do eventually recognize our mothers had lives. Our mothers are human beings. They were human beings before we came along. They have their own, their dreams, their disappointments, the, all the things. And one of the thoughts that supports me in feeling dignity and feeling that how I want to feel and have that compassion is, and it, the thing about these these statements is that they are they're different for everyone and you you sort of like you want to do a body check and like yes oh god yes this feels good to me but one of mine is she's a woman just like me yeah mm-hmm. that's nice. yep yeah. right and it's like when i i'm oh yes okay boom there it is and then i have other other you know for audacity every once in a while right it's like freak yeah you know and that's all it says and i know how it feels and i like you know where that leads me right Right. It's yeah. Go ahead, Laura. Well, just you were talking, Karen, about your mother um, and, and, you know, calling you stupid. And what it, what came up for me is one of the things I had to grapple with um, in my caregiving and also in writing the memoir uh, was that I had to face that I had these habitual stories about my mother, that it didn't just go one way, it went the other way. And, yeah. and that I really set in stone her uh, transgressions, you know, all the ways she had failed me, all the ways she had betrayed me. They were like in these marquee lights and, <laughs> and her good qualities. And she did have a lot of good qualities. I just like dismiss them. It was like, they were just water flowing through my, my fingers so that I reinforced my story about her that validated 
me as the hero and me as the victim and whatever else I needed to believe about myself. And I not only reinforced it by selectively noticing things and remembering things, but then I went and talked to everybody I knew about it. So like when my mother moved out here, there were a lot of people already set against her because of the stories I had told. And I and Karen, my my wife, really confronted me about that. And I I felt really bad about having done that. But so I one of the things I had to face was, you know, how I had not been fully honest or transparent and how I um, it was so invested in seeing her in a particular way. And, and it didn't allow either one of us to change and it didn't allow our relationship to evolve. So for me, letting go of my habitual stories was really, really critically important. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. me too. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and, you know, from a biological perspective, right? We do have a negativity bias. And so our brains love to look for negative evidence or, you know, that kind of thing. So it, 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 it's, but it's just something to notice. Like, yes, I have a story about my mother and I'm going to look for evidence all over the place for how it's real and true. And, um, you know, when, you know, not, not everyone is ready to do this right away, but when you are ready to do it and, you know, to find and I've done this, right? There's lots of things I really admire about my mom. And I see how I'm just like her in some ways, not just the good things, right? Not the, not just the things I admire. Um, but doing a little bit of that, you know, what's called shadow work, right? And to to see, yep, just like mom in that way, or and and not liking it so much. And 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 or, but then having compassion for the part of me that, you know, yeah, we we share this thing that's maybe not so great. <laughs> And how could right. we not? Because I mean, right. who do we exactly. model ourselves after for better or worse? And mm -hmm. I also, I also think one thing that, and I, you know, I don't know if I'm, if this is correct, but I suspect that we have an opportunity. We have the opportunity, or I should say one way we have an opportunity that our mothers maybe didn't is that we can examine when we feel ashamed or guilty and learn how to process those emotions rather than let them lay sort of unconscious and, and running the show. Yep. Because again, like when my mother tells me that I'm weak and ineffectual, just like my father who she divorced when I was two and a half and she hated her whole life. Um, you know, and I'm left to be like, uh, yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Is, is where does she herself feel weak and ineffectual and where hasn't she been able to grapple with that? Maybe, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and one of my favorite quotes is from Carl Jung and it is, I'd rather be whole than good. That's beautiful. And, yeah. and women aren't allowed to be whole. No. Mm -mm. And so, you know, we are learning to be more whole, hopefully. And whereas our mothers, right, they maybe let those, the, those, that the shadow side fester because yeah. they didn't have the, the opportunities that we do. Speaking of uh, favorite quotes, one of my favorites is one I put in the front of Burning Light of Two Stars. And it was this, this former student of mine, Deborah Fruche, and she said, Every time I look into the past, every time I look in the rear view mirror, the past has changed. And, yeah. you know, I think that for me, that is such a hopeful statement uh, because yeah. it really shows that we can grow and evolve as human beings and that our, our these long, deep, incredibly complicated relationships, like a mother-daughter relationship, that it is possible for it to change in ways we might never anticipate. And it may not, but in my instance, you know, it, it, if you had said to me when I was 27 or 28 years old and my mother were at, we were at war, absolute war, that I would be at her deathbed and I would be taking <laughs> care of her at the end of her life, I would have looked at you like you were the most insane person. So for me, that, that gives me a lot of hope about life that no matter how stuck we are and how trapped we feel or how challenging things are, that things can be different uh, in the future and in ways we just cannot anticipate. Yeah. So, yep. so I just really like that, you know, every time we look in the rear view mirror, the past has changed. Agreed. Agreed. 
And I think empathy has a lot, uh, has a, a long way. A, it's a long play here because we have to try to understand each other and we have to try to, to extend that. Do you know what I mean? It's the extension. It's not, it's not always going to work and that's okay too, but it's an extension and you, I, you've both characterized that. Yeah. And I, um, it's, it's like, I, you know, liking and respecting my reasons are, you know, and, and, and why I'm doing something is not so that she'll, be a certain way. It's like, I'm not doing something to have something work. Right. Right. It's, I like, I I like who I am when I'm this way, whether she is or not. Yeah. I almost also feel like when you talk about having your words on the wall, it's almost like having an alter ego, like, I'm, you know, like Beyonce and Sasha Fierce, like I'm going (laughs) to have today I'm Sasha Fierce, you know, get me my wind machine and I'm going at this, but it, it almost is that, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that's very powerful about being a human being and that again, we are not taught this is that being able to summon emotion intentionally is like, I mean, that's what witches do, I guess, and goddesses and like all that kind of stuff that people talk about, but like every human being can do that. Yes. And it's not perfect. We don't do it like, you know, but it it is something that we can play with and we can uh, expand capacity for. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a way of working it out. Yes. Laura, your, I feel like your story is a story, and I don't want to say redemption, but it's a story of redemption almost, because you did go from this point of, I don't know if we're ever going to be, you know, you had a lot of anger, you had a lot of resentment, and then wound up caring for her. I know you have uh, something you wanted to read from your book about going from that point to then being the good daughter and caring and and all of that that went with it. Yeah. Just to introduce this, this takes place, most of the book takes place when my elderly mother has moved across the country. So this is, and I was describing, I described this scene and now I'm going to read it to you. It was, it was when um, I came and she confronted me about my distance. And so this is what I wrote. Three decades earlier, I had erected an impenetrable wall between us a fortress with narrow slits so I could watch her approach. I ensured that my defenses were prepared any time she came near me. I always had an escape plan. It's true we later reconciled, and the fact that we were able to create a functional relationship was a miracle, but it wasn't an intimate miracle because I never took down my wall. Oh, I taught myself to be kind to her in a fake it till you make it kind of way, but I still held her at bay. My wall just got subtler. It wasn't permeable. It was hard and opaque, and there was no door. We only met in the antechamber, the common room where guests are received. Only my polished self was on display, my masked self and only in the antechamber. Mom never saw my inner sanctum and I never saw hers. I got as close as I could within the constraints I had established, but closed is closed and a closed heart is a lonely one. The price I paid to keep my mother out, at first with withdrawal, later with an armed fortress, and finally with the polite rules of detente, was love, the pure unfettered love I longed for, the pure unfettered love she craved. That day in the kitchen when I couldn't comfort her, I had to face it. My mother was still a stranger to me with tentacles of need I was loath to touch. I wanted to be more than kind, to do more than merely what was right. I wanted to love my mother, just once, freely and with the relief of a lost, exhausted child, beyond words and beyond all pretense. I wanted to lay my head on a place that was safe, just once, before it was too late. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you for reading that. 
Yeah, that was the that's the trajectory. You know, every uh, protagonist in a story has a a trajectory of where they're going, and that that I like to read that because it really summarizes kind of the quest I had. Could I open my heart? I I feel like I'm in this like again ten years prior, right? You know, you're ten years down the road for me in this scenario, and um, I crave the same thing. Crave the same thing. It's amazing. It's an amazing journey through all of it because you learn, not only do you learn so much about your mother, you learn so much about yourself yeah. mm-hmm. and what you, what you value and what you have inside of you that you may not have realized before. You know, it's funny when I spoke to my mom on Sunday, uh, yesterday, she, we were talking about her mom a little bit and she had nothing to do with her mother in the final years of her mother's life. Mm. And I actually, her, my mother's husband has dementia. And so part of this whole thing of them perhaps moving is, you know, a place where he can be in a memory care unit or whatever. And I was, I mentioned, I'm like, yeah, well, you know, grandma had dementia and she was in this place. And I mentioned the name of the place. She had dementia. Oh my God. I was like, yeah. Wow. Well, that's, that's amazing, Sharon. <laughs> that's like my mother saying, you had breast cancer? <laughs> exactly. Your mother yeah. the excuse of dementia. She just wow. didn't want to deal with it. Yeah, she, she, yeah, I, again, it's, sometimes it's shocking, right? Like we, these things our mother says, like, oh, you know, um, and like, I, I see the guardedness, right? I see the places where she has chosen to be guarded right? Of course she has, right? Of course we do. Right. And what do you do with that? Yeah. You love yourself through it. Yep. Yep. What would you advise to caregivers in, in tackling this? You, Karen? Love yourself through it. Know yourself, right? Know your triggers. Don't shame yourself. And, you know, we mentioned self-care is that word, right? Like taking care of yourself doesn't mean, I mean, it can mean going and getting a pedicure, but it really is tending to yourself. It's like, you know, I mean, I, some really simple things like look up and out, look out at the horizon, right? This is a way that you're, you're sending a signal of safety to your body that everything is okay. Simply Mm -hmm. twisting in your chair once in a while does the same thing. Like these are like things that you can do in a moment, chanting, humming, singing, uh, like this. Yes. Tapping yourself, reminding yourself, this is, I'm here, I'm here. Yes. Yes. Because we lose our bodies. Pressing we your lose feet our, into the our floor, commit. you know, yep. it's like feeling grounded. Earth supporting yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. I love what you said about the pedicure. I love that because it's yeah. just like, there's like this like self-care mantra that, that feels like something packaged on Instagram, you know, like yes. purchase your self-care here, you know, and it's, yeah, it's so much more organic and rudimentary than that. Yes. It's mothering yourself. Yeah. Right. And when, and if you didn't learn that, if you didn't get it right, you, it's like, you have to sort of figure it out. That's how, what the next, my next book is about is, is about remothering. Oh, that's awesome. That's great. Yeah. And Laura, what would you say? Listen, you've, you've run the gamut. What would you say to somebody who's, who says to you, uh, you know, my mom needs help. I don't know what I'm going to do. We never really got along. What would you tell them? <laughs> I tell them to get into therapy. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> totally. I would tell yes. them because I wouldn't tell them you should or you shouldn't, you know, it's like that. It's a journey. It's definitely a, you know, it's, it, and it, for me, a lot of really unexpected things and, and times I just hit the wall and other times I was like really proud of myself and, but yeah, it's, it's like being an advice. That's how I felt. But in retrospect, <laughs> I'm so grateful I did it. You know, I, I feel like I, I became, I, w- I showed up as the daughter I wanted to be. And it wasn't because I had to, or I should, or I owed her, because I think, I think when someone betrays you in a really severe way, they break the expectations of what children owe to their parents. And then it's really up to the adult child to make a decision. Well, 
I'm thinking about this, this woman I interviewed um, for my reconciliation book, the one I wrote 20 years ago, I thought we'd never speak again. And she had an incredibly toxic relationship with her mother. Her mother was abusive and nasty. And her and she and the woman was a hospice worker. So her profession was taking care of people who were dying. And her mother contacted her and said she was dying of cancer. And so this and this they had had you know nothing to do with each other. And and this woman said, she said, I had to really face what kind of person, what kind of daughter did I want to be? And she decided that she would never take her mother into her home, that she could not be her direct physical caregiver. But because of all her contacts and everything she knew, she was able to arrange really good care for her mother. And she decided that she would go visit her mother for two hours every Wednesday afternoon. And she would go and she would be fully present with whatever was happening. Um, and she did that until her mother died. And she said she felt like she that was the level at which it made sense for her to be her mother's caregiver. And I, I really love that. Mm -hmm. she, and she said she felt clean. She felt good. She during that those months, she tried, you know, for like the 18,000th time to actually have some kind of breakthrough with her mother. It never happened. Her mother was not capable. But she was able to show up and be kind, be loving, be generous, but keep her boundaries and protect herself. So, you know, I think that that's really important for people to know that there's there's a lot of different ways to do it. And someone else I'm thinking of, um, the parents had sexually abused her and then sexually abused her children. And she was never going to see these people again or have any mm -hmm. contact with no. them. But when she found out they were dying, she said she did all this internal work to be able to actually send loving kindness to these two people who were so damaged that all they could do was damage the next generations. And she said she just got in touch with how much suffering they were in because they were living with that toxic stew 24 hours a day. She hadn't been around them in decades already. And she said she was able to send them loving kindness from afar. And that was the extent of what she was able to offer. And so I just think there's this whole continuum and it's gonna, different things are gonna make sense for different people, depending on so many factors that we don't know. But to, but to, to let go of the idea that I have to do this, I owe this, I must do this, when the relationship has been devastatingly broken by the other person. It just isn't true. I hope you enjoyed our podcast today. To find more information about Laura Davis, her books and writing workshops, visit her website at lauradavis.net. And for more information on Karen Anderson and her books, visit her website at kclanderson.com. Head over to daughterhood.org and click on the podcast section for show notes, including the full transcript and links to any resources and information from today's episode. You can find and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Daughterhood the Podcast and on my blog, heyrow.com. Feel free to leave me a message and let me know what issues you may be facing and would like to hear more about. Or even if you just want to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. Also, a very special thank you to Susan Rowe for our theme music, the instrumental version of her beautiful song, Mama's Eyes, from her album Lessons in Love that you can find on the Apple Store. I hope you found what you were looking for today. Information, inspiration, or even just a little company. This is Roseanne Corcoran. I hope you'll join me next time in Daughterhood.